Hi, and welcome to a Red Reviews number 12 um, with Justin Clark. How's it going? It's going all right. How are you? I'm not too bad. Good. I, uh, I think uh, if we go, if we have a conversation after the live show, uh, we will probably uh, talk about the dress discourse uh, for AOC. <laughs> for sure. For sure. We can totally talk about the dress that blew up the internet for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for anyone watching live, thank you. And if you uh, happen to uh, view this after the fact, uh, please subscribe to the channel and hit like and all that stuff and share it around. Um, it, that apparently, like. this is the only place on the internet where you're going to find a Marxist and an anarchist talking civilly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, man. That's really, really great. You know, and, uh, you know, and I got like a positive comment on one of the videos I did recently. So I saw that. That was fun. Thank you to the person who said nice words in the comments. Um, uh, I think it was on the Black Shirts and Reds review we did. Um, so uh, and if those who are listening haven't checked our, yep. our discussion of Black Shirts and Reds, please do, because it's an awesome bra- it's an awesome book and it was a really fun discussion. Yep, for sure. Um, so tonight, so um, yeah, so tonight we're going to be talking about a book that is been, I think, very influential over the last 10, 15 years of discourse, especially within Marxist circles. Um, uh, and it's a book called A Brief History of Neoliberalism by David Harvey. Okay. Now, for those who don't know, so David Harvey is kind of one of the most, one of the mo- uh, foremost um, Marxists in the world. Um, he's not a Marxist Leninist like me. This is where we'll get into those sort of disagreements, but, um, but he, uh, is a economic geographer. That's kind of the way that he's described. So he was really one of the forerunners of thinking about the way in which geography plays into our conceptions of capitalism and using a Marxist analysis okay. to thinking about, um, the, the ways in which spatial, Demo, like spatial designations frame society and capitalism. Um, and he teaches at the, um, the city university of New York, CUNY. Um, and he is, uh, he teaches in the anthropology and geography departments. Um, he's probably best known for his, um, his companion to Marx's capital. So he starting a few years ago did lectures on Marx's seminal work, um, uh, which was published on this day, September 14th, oh, 1867. Nice. Um, the day we're recording this, maybe not the day it's released. Right. right. Um, but, uh, but he, he has, uh, a series of lectures on Marxist capital that people find very informative. And then he race and he also does a, uh, a podcast called the anti-capitalist chronicles, um, for cool. the democracy at work network. Uh, that's Richard Wolf's outfit. So he's very prominent, very well known, um, uh, kind of a, a very influential figure. You know, folks like Naomi Klein have, have cited uh, David Harvey as an influence. Nice. Um, the the sort of political activist and writer, best known for like the Shock Doctrine and No Logo. He's been very influential on her and other folks for sure. So we're going to be talking about his brief book that was, I think, published in 2006 or seven called A Brief History of Neoliberalism. Okay. And I want to open up the discussion with the definitions. This is one of the things I always try to do every episode that we d- discuss. If we discuss a term, the first thing we do is, OK, well, what does that mean? How do we sure. define those terms? So neoliberalism, this is a word that's thrown out all the time. You've probably heard it in all kinds of places, in, di- in the discourse, on the Internet, in articles you've read and whatnot. Yeah. What is neoliberalism? So neoliberalism is a political philosophy that really started to gain ground in the 1970s. And it's a philosophy that is centered around the marketization of pretty much everything. So it's about getting away from shared notions of the commons, public goods, social welfare, and moving towards a more individualized society in which markets inform every action that we take. And so neoliberalism is also uh, backed up by certain levels of um, regulatory reform 
So when we talk about regulatory reform, it's like basically deregulation, which is probably another term you've heard before, yeah. which is that you know from the 1930s in the United States up until about the 1970s was sort of the era of what David Harvey calls embedded liberalism, um, what we would also call basically like welfare state capitalism or welfare state liberalism, where right. you have – Capitalism, you have markets, you have private ownership, but you also have this paired with an expanding and expansive welfare state. Um, and this is all over most of industrialized countries. So if you think of the National Health Service in the UK, you think of, you know, universal health care in, in your home country of Canada, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, um, TANF, which is temporary aid to needy families. Um, so in the United States, it's like food stamps, you know, all these social welfare programs. What neoliberalism seeks to do is it basically moves the government's role from being the person who sort of is the supporter of last resort to being the sort of arbiter of market exchanges. And it okay. really only exists to be an arbiter and, and protector of the market. Um, and the, the other thing that goes along with uh, neoliberalism is lowering of taxes. So getting rid of, of taxes on the wealthy, getting rid of regulations on financial um, institutions and products, um, getting rid of social welfare programs, as we discussed, getting rid of um, uh, workplace protections, unions, the gutting right. of unions is a big component of neoliberalism. And so... Neoliberalism can kind of be best summed up by one of its biggest proponents, who is former Prime Minister of Great Britain, Margaret Thatcher, right. who said in an interview that there is no such thing as society. There are only individuals. And then later on, she kind of got some shit for saying that. And she had to kind of walk it back. And so she added individuals and their families. But... The original formulation <laughs> is much closer to her real vision of it. So yeah. no such thing as society. We're only individuals duking it out in a marketplace. So it's so it definitely has this sort of social Darwinist component to it, right? This sort of, you know, uh, survival of the fittest kind of notion of, yeah. of, of, of Darwin's ideas or bastardization of Darwin's ideas. And so David Harvey gets into, in the book, he gets into sort of the history, the theory, and the practice of neoliberalism over the past, you know, three or four decades. And the origins of neoliberalism really start, I mean, obviously they go back to what it's called neo, meaning new, right? So it's neoliberalism, right. right? So when people hear, this is kind of another issue, like in like the, in the, in Canada and like the UK, Liberal means a very different thing than it does in the United States. I think to a certain extent, maybe liberal in Canada is probably closer to American liberalism, but, but liberal actually is not like socialist or like even really progressive. Like liberalism is the political philosophy around individual rights, protection of private property and the regulation of free exchange in a market. So like right. liberalism is the justifying ideology of capitalism. And so what is neoliberalism? Well, neoliberalism, ironically enough, even though it's called sort of new liberalism, right, is that it's actually hearkening back to an earlier mode of capitalism before the New Deal in the United States or sort of before right. welfare state capitalism of the, of the mid 20th century which was in many ways a response to the Soviet Union. This is something that's not often discussed enough, but I think it's very important is that, uh, you know, the capitalist countries like the United States, Canada, Great Britain, and so on, a lot of them developed welfare policies in order to stave off communist revolution. Right, yeah. and Or some kind of revolutionary fervor, right? Especially from, from either the socialists or the communists. Um, because there used to be hundreds of thousands of people in the United States that belonged to the Socialist Party or the Communist Party. Yeah. And so when the, when the communist, when the, sort of the Red Scare happens in America, it sort of kills the momentum that these parties have. And it sort of sets the stage for what would become neoliberalism. So in many ways, neoliberalism, like I said, even it's called new liberalism, it's a hearkening back to a different era of capitalism where there were less regulations, less taxes, less social welfare, less sort of 
notions of the commons and so on. And so it really kind of begins its sort of intellectual birth in the 1940s. And there's an organization that exists um, that's developed. It's sort of a, a club of sorts of some of the most influential neoliberal figures of the 20th century. And they meet in France at, in Mont Pelerin, and it's the Mont Pelerin or Mont Pelerin Society. And the Mont Pelerin Society was sort of the business roundtable of its day. You know, these were, you know, and members of the Mont Pelerin Society were certainly influential business leaders, but also some of the figures that would become very important to the history of neoliberalism, like the economist Friedrich Hayek, um, the economist Ludwig von Mises, and the economist Milton Friedman. Mm -hmm. All of these guys play a really key role in the development of the Mont Pelerin mm -hmm. Society alongside, you know, business leaders, very influential ones. For sure. And their goal is sort of a long-term strategy to reassert what, what they saw as the real liberalism, you know, what we would call libertarianism today. Right, yeah. And they start by basically finding ways to become a component of the academic culture of the United States. So this is where Hayek and Mises come to the United States and become professors at American universities. Hayek, most notably at the Chicago, the University of Chicago. Neoliberalism is very much associated with the University of Chicago and its economics department. You've probably heard the Chicago School yeah. of Economics before. Some of this information is also in Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine. So she definitely leans heavily on Harvey's work here too. And so, these guys over time start building a sort of intellectual argument and movement for neoliberalism. And, and at the time, it was extremely unpopular to be in that position. You know, in the 1940s, the overwhelming paradigm of, of economic study in the world, especially in the Western world or the developed world, was Keynesianism, right? Um, which is named after John Maynard Keynes, the economist who believed in not supply side economics, which is what the, the Mont Pelerin guys were, but demand side or sort of, um, you know, so the government acts as the employer of last resort or the lender of last resort. Then in times, he's, of uh, yeah, he's the reason that stimulus checks are a thing. Yeah. Kind He's of. the reason that stimulus <laughs> checks are a thing. He's the reason that infrastructure projects are a thing. You know, yeah. a lot of what the New Deal was kind of came out of Keynesian ideas. Yeah. And the, the sort of post-World War II economic order that is developed is very much built on the ideas of Keynes and what was called the Bretton Woods system. And we've kind of talked a little bit about this before, I think, in previous episodes. Um, but the Bretton Woods system was, was developed after World War II. It was basically a series of economic policy reforms that would unite the new sort of global marketplace post-World War II. So it was the development right. of the World Bank, the development of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank being a, um, a sort of financier of global uh, of global finance for countries that needed money. And then IMF was sort of a, a, the, the institution that would help economies that were facing economic stress or economic downturns and sort of become a lender of last resort on the global scale. The US dollar became the standard currency of the world. So it became the, what's called the global reserve currency of the GSC or the GRC rather. Um, and that was pegged to gold. So you could still, in the United States, you could still go into a bank and have your, your money be redeemable by gold or silver, um, which had been kind of taken out of play in the 1930s under the New Deal when FDR basically ended the gold standard. It kind of came back with the Bretton Woods system. All of this is what Harvey calls what I mentioned earlier, that sort of embedded liberalism. So it's about pairing capitalism and markets and free enterprise with robust government regulation, intervention, and social welfare. And those two things go hand in hand, right? Well, to sort of skip a few decades, by the mid-1970s, this system starts to break down completely. And before we get any further, I'll stop there for a second and see, do you have any questions, comments 
Um, no, I think uh, I think that it's all pretty clear. Like you say, like mm-hmm. um, yeah. there comes a time, like you say, when this kind of shifts that from the view that the government is there to supply uh, money for infrastructure and for a welfare state and stuff like that. Yeah. And ultimately, as we've discussed a lot, you know, I think us on the left broadly think of it this way, whether whatever a tendency we are, is we start thinking about the contradictions of capitalism, right? In the Marxist perspective, you have the decline of profit over time, the, the, the sort of contradiction between, you know, the sort of socialization of a firm versus the sort of chaos of a market, right. that there's organization and, and, and planning in production, but there's you know, sort of markets and chaos and distribution, right? And that's another sort of tension. We talked about that in our episode with Angles. Yeah, yeah. And so these contradictions start really coming to the fore in the 1970s. And neoliberalism, one of the components of neoliberalism that's super important to understand is that no government, well, not, let, me not, let me not say government, no citizenry, no populace would ever choose it. Right. <laughs> this is like, it's like, they would never choose a neoliberal society. If they had, if they had to pick out under a few different choices, I guarantee you that like neoliberalism would be like dead last or second to last. No one would want it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so the way in which neoliberalism is sort of foisted upon populations is it's done in moments of crisis. And in the 1970s, there were a series of crises that facilitated the rise of neoliberalism. The first one was the rise of a genuine left in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first major events that sort of heralded the beginning of the age of neoliberalism was the coup that happened on September 11th, 1973 in Chile, also known as the Other 9-11. Um, in 1973, the Chilean dictator, this Chilean general, Augusto Pinochet, who had become the dictator of the country for like 20 years after, um, after he took power, um, overthrew the democratically elected socialist leader, Dr. Salvador Allende. Yeah. And they were backed by the U.S. government. And Nixon, uh, who was president at the time, Richard Nixon, who we talked about in a previous episode, um, said that he wanted to make the economy scream. That's what he told to Kissinger and to others was, you know, because Allende was elected, I think, in 1970. He had been in power for a couple of years. And one of the things that they really tried to do was sort of nationalize some natural resources and really move towards a sort of democratic socialist model, right? Yeah. And Allende himself was uh, explicitly an anti-imperialist and fought and sort of, pushed back on the imperial um, ambitions of the United States. Well, uh, he commits suicide during the coup. (laughs) Basically, he was killed. And uh, he was killed, and the Pinochet government took over. Well, what happened when the Pinochet government took over? This is a moment of crisis. So this is where the neoliberals really get to try what they've wanted to do for a long time. And so Chile becomes sort of the the incubator, the sort of test lab of neoliberalism. So the Chicago School economists, led by Milton Friedman and others, go down to Chile and act as economic advisors. And they open up the country to foreign investment. They deregulate a lot of industries and they remove a lot of social protections. And the country becomes a right-wing dictatorship for decades until Pinochet eventually is... is, um, uh, uh, either I think he either leaves office or is overthrown, and then he's tried for war crimes, and then a democracy um, is developed again in Chile. Um, and so the constitution that was written for Chile after a, uh, uh, Pinochet took over was explicitly rewritten for the purposes of neoliberalism, which is why a lot over the last couple of years we've seen growing protests in Chile calling for a constitutional referendum because yeah. of how neoliberal in practice that their constitution currently is. And so this leads to widespread poverty, inequality, violence, and just a sheer amount of human suffering. Yeah, just the brutal, brutal crackdown by Pinochet's uh, 
regime. Absolutely. And but this is very good to American investors and the capitalist class. It, it works in their benefit. Um, and one of the big things like under capitalism, we know that wealth funnels upward, right? Like, but the thing is, is that like neoliberalism was something where it, yes, wealth does funnel up, but even more so because there are no, there are basically constraints go away and any sort right. of democratic barriers to a capitalist excess are ripped away. And so it can just be full bold face exactly what it is. Yeah. So that's the first thing that really happens that changes a lot of things. The second thing that happens that's really, really important is the New York City debt crisis of 1975. So this is where neoliberalism comes home for the first time. In 1975, New York City was on the verge of bankruptcy and was incredibly financially insolvent after years and years and years of racking up debt, um, which was done by both parties um, back when Republicans used to have liberal wings. Um, the former New York mayor, John Lindsay, who was a liberal Republican, who believed in sort of the social welfare aspect and the civil rights aspect of public policy. So in the 1975 uh, crisis, New York is trying to figure out what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And this is where you get the infamous line from President Gerald Ford, who says, you know, New York, you know, Gerald Ford, Ford in New York dropped dead. Basically, we're not going to help you. We're not going to bail you out. We're, you know, and in earlier eras, that's probably what it would have happened was yeah, yeah. that the federal government would kind of come in, be a lender of last resort and whatnot. But what happens in New York is truly endemic of what has happened over the last few decades, especially after the 2007, 2008 crash, um, is austerity. Yeah. And, and so it's cutting back on social services, cutting back on public goods, raising cutting, taxes, on, raising taxes, mostly on regular people, yeah, on regular people, 90 <laughs> most of it and trying to balance the budgets. And this is what they do in New York. And so New York – and the other thing that happens with New York is New York moves away from being this sort of city that had a rich and diverse um, economic con uh, economic situation, which people from various backgrounds and income backgrounds lived in New York City. And not just lived in New York City, but also like lived in Manhattan, right? Um, but where the investor class and the financiers basically took it over. And they started selling off parts of New York basically to the highest bidder, which is the other thing that happens under neoliberalism. The stuff that was originally held in common, that was public, is then privatized and then yeah. sold off, usually for pennies on the dollar. And and it's absolutely devastating for generally for the general populace and for democracy in general. Yeah. And so we see the economic reforms in Chile. We see the austerity reforms in New York. And then the, this really all comes to the head. The, the real era of neoliberalism begins between 1979 and 1981. 1979 is when Margaret Thatcher becomes prime minister of Great Britain. Um, she was elected after many, many years of the Tories, the conservative party of which she was a member of, had been out of power. The, the, the Labour government had been in power for many, many years. And England, the United Kingdom, UK had been in basically a a long-term economic slump. Right. Um, and But at the same time, the economy is kind of going into the ditch, but workers have more power than ever. Right. And so there's this like real shift that could happen where that society could have genuinely had achieved some form of socialism, right? Yeah, yeah. But it didn't. And it didn't because she used very much what Reagan used to win the White House because he wins the presidency in 1980, becomes president in 1981. And these two figures are sort of the intellectual and political figureheads of neoliberalism as a project. Yeah. And they sell it on the backs of white resentment, which is something we've talked about before. We talked about For the sure. Nixon land episode. Yeah. And so they both come to power and they institute a wide slew of reforms. And they also break organized labor. In Thatcher's case, it's the coal miners. Yep. Um, so after a series of, of long-term strikes, um, what they called the winner of discontent, she finally breaks the coal miners union. And then organized labor no longer has the influence and power that it had in Great Britain. And then in the United States, the same thing happens with the air traffic controllers in 1981. 
The air traffic controllers that are federal employees, they go on strike. They're part of a union. I can't remember what the union's called. It might be called AMCO or something like that or, or, or AMRO or something like that. But the union goes on strike and under federal law, it's illegal for federal employees to go on strike. That's like a thing. But people do it anyway. And so Reagan said, he came out and he said, if you don't go back to your jobs, then I will fire you all. And he called their bluff and he did fire them all. Yeah. And that broke that union. And unions began the sort of long, steady decline in the United States, starting after the early 1980s. And so neoliberalism came out of crisis. And it came out of crisis because the 1970s economically were an extremely shitty decade for multiple reasons. Yeah. You had countries that had way too much debt on their books. You had you had two things in the United States, uh, economic stagnation and then inflation. So your dollar went a lot – it went a lot less far every week for you than it did a few years prior. And those two things together were called stagflation. This is the kind of thing that sort of – ruined Gerald Ford's presidency and led to the election of Jimmy Carter in 1976. And alongside Watergate, the pardon of Nixon, which is kind of the other component too. Really? Um, and we'll talk more about this when we do the other Rick Perlstein book, The Invisible Bridge. But yeah. um, but so, you know, and in England, it's the same situation. In most of the industrialized world, it's the same thing. The economy is just awful. And it's, it's because the contradictions of capitalism have really come to their full force, right? Right. You have the decline of profit over time. You have continuing economic crises every four to seven years. But you also have a rising workers' movement that is extremely powerful and has an incredible amount of leverage. And in order to institute those reforms, they had to break labor's leverage. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah. So – and that <laughs> that's left us – straggling ever since in a, in a sense, right? Like yeah. we're, it, it basically ruined our, uh, any progress the left had. Yeah. Well, and, and it, you're right. And I think the other issue too, is that, you know, there were just structural problems with the global economy as it was. Um, because as I was mentioning, when I discussed earlier, the sort of Bretton Woods system, when the Bretton Woods system broke down, it also, it, when it broke down, it broke down in the 1970s. So in 1971, Nixon takes the U.S. off the gold standard, effectively ending a major component right. of the Bretton Woods system. Um, capital controls, which are a huge component of the Bretton Woods system, where banks and financial institutions can only move so much amount of money around the globe at any given time. Um, those were eventually gotten rid of by the 1980s, of removing these capital controls, removing these financial controls. And this led to the... the the emergence of financialization, which is something we'll talk about in a future episode when we do a, a really good companion book to the one we're discussing tonight, which is Grace Blakely Stolen. Okay. Um, this is an excellent book that kind of picks up where uh, Harvey's book leaves off and talking about the 2008 crisis. Um, Grace Blakely's awesome. She's a Marxist economist and journalist, and I highly recommend people check her out. She's also written a book about the coronavirus pandemic, too. Very so cool. called the Corona crash. But anyway, um, so we see the systems breaking down. The Keynesian model is breaking down. The New Deal coalition is falling apart. The, the labor coalition in Britain is falling apart. Now, that's not the only place where neoliberalism is happening. It's also happening halfway across the globe in China. Okay. And so this gets into um, – for us, Marxist Lenin is probably the most – controversial chapter of his book, which is about China. And so in the late 1970s, there is a major change within the Chinese government. Um, Mao Zedong, the revolutionary leader of, of the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China, he dies in 1976 after a sort of short power struggle. In 1978, the main leader of the Chinese Communist Party and its reforms is a man named Deng Xiaoping. And Deng Xiaoping sort of comes to power in 1978. And over the next few years, they institute their own form of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. But it's different. And this he calls it neoliberalism with Ch Chinese characteristics, right? <laughs> so it's it's so it's 
What they do is they do open up the country to foreign investment. This starts a few years, sort of the beginnings of opening up China to the world start a few years earlier with Nixon's legendary visit to China in 1972, um, which formally started diplomatic relations between the U.S. and, and the PRC, um, which underscored the sort of what they call the Sino-Soviet split. So the Chinese, the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union didn't always see to eye to eye. And especially by the 1970s, their paths start to diverge. Right. And they go different. They just go different ways. Um, we obviously know how that kind of ended up. And um, so kind of. <laughs> kind of. So what happens with their reforms is, again, the Institute opening up the beginnings of trade, the beginnings of of um, manufacturing uh, on a larger, more market-based scale. You have the, the development of what they called uh, economic opportunity zones, I think are called, or EOSs, uh, EOZs rather. And these are specific areas within China, areas okay. around like Hong Kong and so forth that open up and are even more sort of economically liberalized than other components of the economy. Stuff that used to be state-owned enterprises or SOEs, the amount of state-owned enterprises declines um, the, the, st- the, the amount of state employment also declines as a result of these firms becoming more privatized. And so you see the beginnings of neoliberalism in China, where I think the book is limited in its analysis is mainly just on time and orientation on mm-hmm. China. So in terms of time, um, the book is published in the mid 2000s. So the book does not catch up to the Chinese the, the People's Republic of China today. Right. Because one could argue that under the new leader of the PRC and the, the CCP, um, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, that the, the Chinese system is sort of reasserting its Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. It's sort of reasserting its political philosophy and it's trying to sort ah. of correct the ship of the sort of more egregious forms of its neoliberalism. And, and again, we, you know, we can certainly hash out the differences and, and the pros and cons of the PRC, but that's kind of where I think the, the, the book is hampered is it just doesn't catch up, right? It just doesn't, right, yeah. it kind of cuts off right in the era of Chinese economic and foreign policy where it's sort of still in this, we're going to play it kind of cool and just develop. <laughs> and then we're going to assert ourselves later, which is sort of what happens. Um, and, and so the, and then in terms of orientation, right? So like, I think that, like, as a Marxist-Leninist myself, I do think there are, are, are massive uh, pluses to what the PRC has done over time. You know, uh, 850 million people have been pulled out of poverty in the PRC. Right. Most of the time, when people talk about, wow, well, there's a lot less people in extreme poverty today than there were 30 years ago, the vast majority of that is in China or <laughs> India, right? Yeah, that's right. And in China, it's because it's a communist government. And, and... The, the Chinese system has always been balanced with state-owned enterprises, state investment, nationalization of certain industries, particularly in banking. There's all, like, China has always been different on the neoliberal model. It's not been, exp- it's followed its own path. Right. Um, and there's so, private industry, yeah. there's private industry and, and there's like, uh, kind of a, a, it's a different balance than what say you might find in the United States for sure. Right? Yes. There is not, there's not this notion of austerity. Like that's not really a thing. Right. Um, uh, or, you know, in, and they're trying to sort of actually tax billionaire wealth now. Like this is one of the things that they've really tried to do. Um, and, and so, and again, we can, we can sort of hash out the, the criticisms of China. That's fine. But in general, like, they're, you know, we could talk about like the intentions versus realities, but like in general, their intentions now policy wise are far different than they were during the Dang period. And certainly within the last 10 years, there's just, right, there's right. been a complete reorientation. And for those who want to learn more about that, learn more about the sort of intricacies of that, I highly recommend a recent podcast episode of the socialist program with Brian Becker. Okay. Um, where you can learn about the Xi Jinping's come to power and the sort of the, 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 the reorientation of the CCP and the PRC under his leadership from a sort of Marxist Leninist perspective. You can kind of get a, get a, a much better sense of what I'm talking about listening to that podcast. So I recommend that for sure. Cool. Um, and, 
And so again, like I said, I'm not saying China's without criticism. I'm just saying like it's important to sort of lay out historically where things have been changing. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, yeah, there's a there's a difference between uh, uh, revering a state and saying uh, here's where they've done good things and here's where they've done you know <laughs> exactly right. And it's like there's been there's been recent criticism as of late that I've seen in the in the, especially in the Western press about how China is cracking down on on what they called like sissies on television. This is something people have been talking about lately. Okay. It's not, it's not really what they're doing. Um, the, the Western media is kind of framing it that way to make the Chinese look like they're evil, but like, that's not really what they're doing. What they're actually doing is they are trying to push back on people on television who have excessive plastic surgery okay. um, because they're very concerned about their populace getting too much plastic surgery um, and, and sort of, and, and being obsessed with body image and and they're very worried about that as like a social issue right let's, now we now we can debate whether and like and i think that's like the more that's the more close orientation the reason they kind of sort of like sissies or whatever is it's a problem of translation okay but um but but in general that's really what they're doing is they're sort of cracking down on on excessive oh, yeah, yeah. amounts of plastic surgery on television. It was something really, about effeminate men or whatever. Yeah, effeminate else. men. Yeah. And, 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 and in China, what that actually, it doesn't mean like gay or anything like that. What it actually means is that, you know, um, those who are obsessed with like their appearance okay. um, and body image. And so the government sort of cracking down on, you know, people who have excessive plastic surgery on television because they're very concerned about the citizenry getting too much plastic surgery. Now, again, we can have a healthy discussion about whether or not <laughs> yeah, society should do that. Yeah, that's right. Um, or how involved the government should be in your yeah, yep. stuff and that's, like but, that, but right? that's But that's like, I think it's about healthy about like what like, it's, yeah, because it's very important to understand that like the way that like mainstream press in the US or like in Canada will write about China versus like what China is actually doing are often two different things. I mean, sometimes right. they're right on, but some but sometimes they're very different things. And this is one of those situations. Yeah. But anyway, so it's important to like read a variety of different sources. I think the PSL, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, which I'm a candidate of um, to the party, I think they have a book that came out that Brian Becker wrote with a few other people. I think it's called China from Revolution to Counter-Revolution. Now, it came out, I think, around 2007, so it might be a little dated. But okay. I think there is some real relevant stuff in there, too. Um, and we'll discuss China a whole lot more towards the end of the year when we read some Mao and we uh, read When China Rules the World by Martin Jacques. Um, I, but yeah. I, I'm looking forward to that. I really, I actually, I've read a little bit of Mao. I enjoy uh, a lot of the philosophy uh, and ideas mm -hmm. in it. I get, this is some of the stuff that I read. I was like, this idea of putting the party ahead of uh, everything else, it kind of mm -hmm. didn't hit me right, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and that's always the issue with like the the sort of the Leninist model broadly, right? We can talk about like the notion of the party and how it gets in. We can sort of table that for now, but that's sure. a very relevant question. So, needless to say, you know, China, I think, is a much more complicated case than say in the United States or in Europe or in Canada. I think that neoliberalism certainly played a part. You know, to be a good dialectical materialist, you could basically say that China sort of evolved based on the structural economic conditions of the globe. And so they sort right. of realized where the winds were going and they were like, oh, shit, what do we do? They wanted they to also, survive as a state. And yeah, they wanted to survive as a state and as a society. And so and ultimately, the other thing, too, is it goes back to the sort of the developmental model of Marxism, right? That in order to sort of achieve socialism – you must go through these sort of stages of development so you can get to a place where you're really instituting socialism, right? And again, you can make that argument, the pros and cons of that, but that's kind of the difference. Um, and I wish that he had gone more into those differences in the book um, because he takes a more sort of mainstream left position oh, okay. on China than I say I do. Um, but, you know, but it's worth discussing. Um, and then long story short, so we've gotten into the history, we've talked about the theory. So what's the practice? So like, what does this mean? What does neoliberalism mean for you? Long, you know, long story short, basically what it means is that in the, in the last four decades in the United States, wages have practically flatlined. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, some have gone down over time, even though the United States as a whole, its workforce is more productive than ever. 
Um, so you see large scale wage stagnation. You see the amount of personal debt and public debt explode. That's a component of neoliberalism where, um, you know, everybody has credit cards now. Credit cards didn't used to be a thing 30, 40 years ago. And now everybody has them and uses them. Um, and some people have to use them for things that they shouldn't have to, to whether it's with. like to live <laughs> with, yeah. like to live on. Right. Um, like, like I use. Yeah. It's not uncommon for people to say, oh, I use my paycheck to pay my credit card and then I use my credit card to survive. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. You know, and in my case, I'm fortunate enough to be able to sort of use my credit card like a debit card where I just use it for all my expenses and pay it off and then I collect points and shit. Right? Oh, there you go. Um, ironically enough, the main credit card that I use is actually called the Chase Freedom Card. So <laughs> yeah. that kind of gives you a sense of like that's what neoliberalism is, right? It's the freedom to have credit cards and buy shit. Yeah. Um, and so what do we also see in the age of neoliberalism? We see – the decline of unions, you know, union membership in the United States is, I think, somewhere between nine and 11 percent. The vast majority right. of it are public employees. Um, people in the private sector don't belong to really unions anymore at all, despite the fact that unions are more popular than ever. I mean, polling on, on unions. I mean, I think, I think I saw recently like 65 percent of Americans support unions. But there's this huge divide between what the public wants and what policymakers actually do. Right. Right. And if you need any good indication of sort of the, the, the hollowness of neoliberalism, we need to look no further than the fact that in our lifetimes, I'm 31, I have seen three economic crises in my lifetime. <laughs> three yeah. of them. Yeah. The first one was the dot-com bubble that burst in the early 2000s when I was in grade school. That led to, you know, many companies going out of business for fraud, including Enron, WorldCom, and Tyco. Many of them going out of business because they were never profitable to begin with. Um, and that, and how did they become so big so quickly? It was through, uh, creative accounting that was allowed because of deregulation, yeah, because exactly. of neoliberalism, right? Um, for those who are interested in learning more about this, um, I highly recommend a documentary called Enron, the smartest guys in the room. You know, some of you who, who will listen to this or watch this maybe don't have any idea what Enron is, but Enron was this massive energy company. Um, 20 years ago, it was one of the most profitable companies on earth. Um, and their goal was basically to deregulate and marketize, um, oil and natural gas futures. Yeah. So they would basically project the prices of natural gas in perpetuity into the future. And they would can basically be the middleman between suppliers and consumers. Um, but what made them go under was that they used a, a, a policy called mark to market accounting. So basically they just pulled their, their profits and losses out of their ass. It, nothing was ever tied to any, re, any real realities. So the company yeah. was losing millions every year, but on paper, they looked like they were a billion dollar company and they went down in 2002, um, 2001, 2002. Um, and what's interesting about that is really just the connection between Enron and then presidential candidate and future president George W. Bush, um, who was very tied into Enron and the energy companies. And Kenneth Lay, who was the CEO of Enron, almost became our secretary of energy. <laughs> but uh, but then but then um, Enron went down. So that's a very interesting thing. And again, all of this really happens because of those deregulations. Right. So you have. People who don't belong to unions, wages are stagnating, personal debts are all-time highs, corporate debt is at all-time highs, public debt is at all-time highs. You have um, – and then you have the first economic crisis I described, the dot-com bubble. And then you have the 2007-2008 crash and recession, the housing bubble that burst, again, directly as a result of deregulation. And then now we're living through another one, which is the coronavirus crash, which is a sort of – uh, 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 an act of nature comes down on us and we have to respond to it. And this system doesn't respond to anything beyond profit. And so right. because our countries are so marketized and privatized and individualized um, that they don't have robust public goods and, and social welfare. And so as a result, you see, widespread hospital failures across the United States, you know, putting uh, uh, patients in tents in parking lots because we don't have enough people. Um, early on, we couldn't manufacture generators because, or not generators, but um, 
ventilators because mm-hmm. we don't make things in the United States anymore. Yeah. The United States went from being a country that made stuff to that manufactured things to a country that basically buys things. We're a consumer society. And that was really the shift that happens in neoliberalism is the sort of consumerism that really began post-World War II became sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, it just became like even more so. It just, it just, it just, went up astronomically, you know, it went in hyperdrive. That was the word I went on and it went in hyperspace. And, and so, you know, we're living through constant economic crises and the only things that have been able to prop this up have been massive amounts of the federal money going into them and particularly in monetary policy. Now we've talked before about when we did Stephanie Kelton's book, the, the, the monetary myth that, um, or the deficit myth rather, that, you know, debt isn't necessarily a problem. And that's true. Right. But the big issue that we have to talk about is really the debt to GDP ratio. That at some point, the society is not working enough or creating enough goods and services to offset the debts that the society has. And those are, I think, genuine problems that need to be resolved. And the way to resolve them is not through austerity. <laughs> it's not through privatization. It's through... um I mean, in my opinion, it's through revolution, but like in, in the short <laughs> term, right? So what can yeah. we do in the short term? You know, barring revolution, what we do in the short term? Well, it's about re-regulation. Right. It's about reasserting the role of the government in the economic lives, in our economic lives. It's about reasserting the value of public goods, about reasserting the value of the commons, reasserting the value of regulations and worker protections and unions, right? So this is, and we're seeing this all happening, right? We're seeing unions are there are opportunities the unions haven't had in a long time where, you know, there's a, you know, we tried almost, we almost had a union at an Amazon facility. Right. There's a Starbucks that's trying to unionize now. A uh, Starbucks location that would be a huge deal. There um, was, I don't know if it's still yeah. going on. There was a major mm-hmm. coal miners strike in yes. Alabama. Yes, because the, that, that particular mine, I think, was bought out by like a hedge fund or some kind of financial right. firm. Again, this is also the other part of component of neoliberalism too, is the sort of mergers and acquisitions. It's companies becoming even larger because capitalism lends itself toward monopoly yeah. and cartelization. This is something we will talk about more. I feel like this is the episode where I'm like, check this out. We'll talk about this later. We'll talk about this. <laughs> but this book is like a really great conversation starter for all these other things we're going to discuss in, in, sure. in future discussions. Um, when we discuss Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism next year, um, we'll get into the fact that capitalism lends itself towards monopoly and cartelization. And you just see that even more so in, the, in, in neoliberalism. Yeah, like that was kind of stopped uh, in some ways by regulation, right? But as soon as you start removing all these uh, rules, all these <laughs> laws, then they can it can be more and more like Amazon is the only company that owns anything or sells yep. anything. So you, if you don't have monopoly in the United States, you often have what are called oligopolies, where if it's not one company that controls everything, it's five, two or three or four or five <laughs> companies that control everything. Like right? oil. <laughs> like oil. And what do these companies often do in those situations? They collaborate. Yep. You know, so, you know, one example that's not something that's important is oil necessarily. But a few years ago, Apple got in trouble for essentially colluding with, uh, I think, Amazon and maybe one other company to essentially fix the prices of ebooks. Right. That they sort of colluded together to say that our books are only going to be this much and so on. So, again, like. And this goes back to our, I think, a previous episode we were talking about ca- the origins of capitalism. Like, markets aren't inherently capitalistic. Like markets, like you could have a market socialist society. You could have markets within pre-capitalist societies. What really designates capitalism as its thing is that private ownership of the means of yeah. production. That's really what makes capitalism capitalism. It's taking things that were once held in common, putting a fence around them and making people pay for it. And... Um, and so, you know, how do we fight back? And, and that's really the, you know, kind of the question is how do we fight back? And so Harvey makes the argument, interesting enough, I mean, I think this book came out in like 2006, 2007, and he basically, he literally like predicted the 2008 crash. It's, you know, he's like this, this economy, the way it's structured right now will crash. It's bound to do it within the next few years. And he was right. The only thing he was wrong about was the timeline. He thought it was a few years, but only like two. Right. Um, 
And Marxist economists tend to get it because we know that capitalism tends to go into crisis every four to seven years. And pretty much on clockwork, that's what it's been doing. Uh, about every decade, yeah. the shit hits the fan. And you know what happens is that in these situations, the wealthy just get more wealthy. More wealth is sort of absorbed upwards and working class people get left in the lurch. I mean, that, that's yeah. almost always what happens, like, right? You know, think about we're 10 years out from Occupy Wall Street, you know, the big <laughs> protests, right? And yeah. the minimum wage in the United States is still 725. You know, it's been that since 2009, right? Yeah. Um, or the tipped wage in the United States, if you're a waitress or a waiter and you work at a restaurant in the United States, you make $2.13 an hour. And that has been the tipped wage since I was a baby. Right. Since I was an infant, it has been that. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the, and the other thing too that's important about neoliberalism is political crisis. That governments cannot respond to problems. Right. They are hampered because they don't have the expertise because everybody works in the private sector. No one knows how to do anything on a public scale anymore. And they don't have the resources to do it. So that's why when people say like, wow, you know, this American Rescue Plan that passed earlier this year, right? The Biden thing. They talk about this is the most progressive piece of legislation since the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson. It's like, that's technically true. Right. But that's yeah. an extremely fucking low bar because nothing like, has happened. <laughs> nothing has really happened, right? Like, you know, you got one direct stimulus check, you know, it was I think thir it was thirteen hundred dollars. Like they still owed you seven hundred bucks. They right. said they give you two grand, they gave you thirteen. This is another thing too that's important about neoliberalism as well, is that it's a it's both political parties in the United States is that neoliberalism in the United States starts under Reagan and it is solidified and cemented under Bill Clinton in the 90s. And same thing in the United K in the United Kingdom. Margaret Thatcher starts it and Tony Blair who's a labor prime minister who's supposedly on the left cements neoliberalism. Right. This is a pattern where the capitalist parties are ultimately on the same side and they ultimately fight for the same side. And so on the big picture. And then the other component to it too is just increased amounts of militarism, which is, you know, you need more and more militarism and war to prop up this project, which gets into the question of imperialism. Um, and so in general, how do we fight back? We fight back by organizing. We yeah. fight back by developing political institutions that are outside of the state, that are outside of this existing system that fight for workers' rights, that fight for justice, that fight for liberation. Yeah. So in, you know, in my case, that means I'm a member of the PSL or a candidate of the PSL. I can't say I'm a full member yet because I'm not. <laughs> but like, you know, I, I'm a, you know, I'm a part of the PSL for you. You know, it's involved in, you know, uh, anarchist organizations or other kind of activist groups, but it's about finding ways to effectively fight back in the system. And remember that like reforms are not bad in and of themselves, but that reforms are things that we should do on the way to revolution. Yeah. They are not the end. Um, they which is something reach, we can, yeah, we will not reach the end by just mere reform, mere reforms, which we can probably get into in the, in the post game when we talk about AOC's dress. Um, <laughs> yes. but, um, but long story short, um, I'll kind of end it there. Um, sure. brief history of neoliberalism is an incredible book. Um, despite my quibbles with it, I think it's very, very good for mm -hmm. helping people understand what the hell we live in. Um, you know, people always talk about the hellscape. Well, how did it become a hellscape? This book helps to inform that. Yeah. And so I highly recommend it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think it's great. Very cool. So where can people find your other stuff? Sure. So, um, you can find me at justinclark.org. That's my website with not only my work professionally, but also the stuff I do outside of work. Um, I will be having a new article coming out soon in the Truth Seeker magazine um, about the friendship between Eugene V. Debs, the American socialist leader, and my boy over here, Robert Ingersoll, my thesis subject, the th free thinker, talking about, oh, we got a cop. <laughs> Interrupted my on. shit. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> fucking man. Um, but, um, fucking but, uh, pigs. <laughs> fucking pigs, man. Fucking pigs. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, 
That'll be coming out soon. Um, that might initially be under a paywall, but you can always read a version of it that's on my, uh, my, my work blog, um, the Indiana History blog, which um, the links are all in the description that you provide. Um, and then what else is going on, man? Um, and I always say, you know, if you're interested in, in, in learning more about the ideas of Marxism, Leninism and getting involved, I highly recommend people check out the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, you can check out Liberty, uh, Liberty School, which is their sort of educational hub where you can learn a whole lot. There's a new uh, essay by my comrade Derek Ford about ideology and, and how ideology plays in our lives. It's very good. Um, and they have podcasts and all kinds of stuff. So that's a really great resource for people who are interested in learning a little bit more about my political orientation. That's awesome. Um, I guess, uh, before we go, we'll say thank you to, uh, those who viewed us live and yeah, thank uh, you. make sure to uh, subscribe and all the like and all that stuff. This is a, uh, now these will no longer be part of a big project. Every episode is going to be a standalone podcast episode as well as a standalone video. So, um, cause it's just too much work to put everything in one thing. <laughs> and it's probably a little bit more digestible for folks to do it, um, as little chunks too. Yeah. Um, instead of like a then, two and a half hour. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, you know, definitely check out the Patreon. You know, we are always needing more patrons, man. Um, you know, Corey's got to eat guys. He's got to eat. <laughs> That's right. He works really fucking hard. I don't, all I do is I just sit here and babble for, for an hour or whatever. He does really the hard work. So <laughs> make sure that, you know, become a patron, um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and support his work cause it's great. Well, thank you, Justin. And, uh, I guess that's it for us this evening. All right. See you next time. All right. That's all folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Uh, remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. I want to say thank you again to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects when I'm not at work so that I don't have to work as many gig hours. Uh, if you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating and a review on your podcast app of choice or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then you can check out the show notes or check my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical Corey. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other shows, which include Skeptarchy, which is a panel show I do with some very smart people, uh, For Many People's Strength, which is a show about Saskatchewan politics, and a new project I'm involved in that's called the Atheist Humanist Leftist Revolutionaries with my friend Damien Marie at Hope. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is at, is the mind of a skeptical leftist. Or you can send me a friend request, which is uh, facebook.com slash cjbrainstorm. I accept most friend requests. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which you can find on my link tree. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And let's just all try to be kind to other leftists and to all people and even if we think they're wrong. Uh, the battle that we are fighting is an uphill one and has many obstacles, and we will need all the comments we can get. Yeah.